Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Brick by Brick, building a thriving network of listening and spoken language professionals. My name is Judy Sexton. I'm the director of Clark Schools for Hearing and Speech. And I'm Dan Sabucci. I'm the interim director of the Smith College Clark Schools Master of Education of the Deaf program. We're delighted that you've joined us this afternoon. And we're equally excited about this presentation. I'd like to give you a little bit of background on my experience in the field, and then I'll turn it over to Dan. I have been in the field as a deaf educator for 34 years. My experience has been in both the public and private sector um, in the state of Pennsylvania. In addition to that, um, I am on several committees, one of those committees being the Pennsylvania Advisory Committee for Newborn Screening through the Department of Health. My position at, as Director of Clark Schools in Pennsylvania ranges from um, overseeing a program, a center actually, from early intervention, which would be birth through five, mainstream where we're working in public and private schools from elementary through high school and also which is very exciting is working with state departments of ed and school districts in a three state area on mentoring programs for listening and spoken language so this is Dan and in the photo that you're seeing that's me up in the corner I'm the older of the two goats in the picture um, and my background is as a teacher of the deaf and an audiologist. I've been in the field of deaf education, specifically listening and spoken language, for about 31 years and currently working with graduate students in a listening and spoken language training program. This webinar is coming to you via one of the Clark Schools programs. And Clark is, um, you can see the mission there, but children at Clark learn to listen and talk over six different campuses located in Massachusetts, New York, Pennsylvania, and Florida. Today's webinar is the first webinar in a series for 2014. The 2014 Wednesday webinar series um, being the second series, uh, we, there was another series which you can access on the Clark Schools website, which were the Wednesday webinars for 2013. Today's webinar is going to cover a specific topic for listening and spoken language and professional learning. But the Wednesday webinars um, focus, this one focuses on listening and spoken language, designed for professionals who work with children who are deaf and hard of hearing and their families. There will be certificates of participation and listening and spoken language continuing ed credits, which will be available by filling out the evaluation that will be emailed to you tomorrow. If you have questions during this presentation, you can submit them using the control panel on the right-hand side of your screen. And we will address them if we have time um, during the session, and if not afterwards. More information about the rest of the series can be found at the Clark School's website, which is on the slide. The learning objectives for this webinar today uh, focus on three areas. The first objective is we're going to define the role professional development slash learning plays in a listening and spoken language program. The second objective is we'll list and describe the common elements and unique set of skills necessary at each tier of experience for being an effective educator. And the last objective will identify resources and explain how professionals can acquire the knowledge and skill sets needed to be an effective listening and spoken language educator. As we move through the webinar this afternoon, I would like you to think about your own organization, whether you're an administrator or a teacher or a speech pathologist working in a setting and you have a, you're working with a child 
who is deaf or hard of hearing. And I'm going to ask you to consider two questions or ask yourself two questions throughout uh, this webinar. Um, the first question would be, why is it important to build a thriving professional network? Why is it important to your organization, to your school culture? And why is it important to each professional who's working within your organization? What we know is that 85% of families have chosen spoken language options for their children. Over the past decade, there's been tremendous progress in ensuring that families have access to hearing screening when a baby's born. So we have this model across the country, um, which is called the 136 model. And it relates to um, early identification of children who, have, who are deaf or hard of hearing. And so that we would hope that by one month, a child would be identified with the hearing loss. By three months, they would be amplified. And by six months, they would be an early intervention. And if all of those things are in place for that child and their family, we could expect that those children would move into the mainstream. Um, by the time they're in kindergarten. And they're moving into a mainstream environment into your schools and working with professionals who may not have the skill set or the expertise. Uh, you may not have a professional network within your organization. Children who are deaf or hard of hearing and have developed spoken language through listening develop reading ability comparable to their hearing peers who, hear, who are typical who have typical hearing. The second question I would ask that you consider as you move through this webinar is to ask yourself who are the professionals in your school, in your district, that need the unique set of skills necessary to be a listening and spoken language educator. Now you'll see on that slide we have LSL, so I just wanted to uh, bring to the table this afternoon that when we refer to LSL, we mean listening and spoken language. And sometimes we'll use the term LISLs, right. just because it's something com comfortable for us. The premise behind this webinar today is, is the professionals working with these children in your programs, the professionals themselves are responsible for their own learning and a relationship with their supervisors who can support that learning. Today we're going to talk about professionals who work with children using listening and spoken language with a focus on building a network for these professionals. The term network can mean two things. The network can be a group of colleagues who are listening and spoken language specialists and or the network can also be a growing number of professionals who work with children who use listening and spoken language to communicate. On this slide you'll note that listening and spoken language specialists help children who are deaf and hard of hearing develop spoken language and literacy primarily through listening. These professionals guide parents in helping their children develop intelligible spoken language through listening and coach them in advocating their children's inclusion in a mainstream school. Ultimately, parents gain confidence that their children will have access to the full range of educational, social, and vocational choices in life. And this is um, a reference right out of uh, the A.G. Bell Academy. Dan, one of the things that I wanted to just mention as, as you're going through this one particular slide is, for those of some of you may be participating today because you're working with a child in your school, um, some of you may be participating today because your administrator told you that this was something good for you to be participating in with the expectation maybe you're getting a child next year who is deaf or hard of hearing. And so for those of you that may not have experience with listening and spoken language, these are children who learn to listen and talk. Right. Okay, so we know that, that every student deserves an effective teacher. That's why you are here today. Every one of us wants to be as effective as we can, and that will impact all our students' learning. This quote from Ellen Moore is a good one. As we focus on teacher effectiveness to increase student learning, 
we, can meet, we cannot merely focus on accountability. We must also remember teachers are learners too. Only when accountability is paired with professional learning can we dramatically improve outcomes in the classroom across the state. That is why it's important to have a person who is specialized in listening and spoken language to ensure that effectiveness. As Judy mentioned, newborn hearing screening has allowed for children to be identified earlier, usually hopefully by one month, amplified hopefully by three months, and getting early intervention by, th by six months. Some of these are, uh, students are already ready to be mainstreamed by kindergarten or first grade, and the professionals out there who are serving them need to be able to have a professional learning continuing continuum. Many professionals serving them in public or private schools have little knowledge about hearing loss. The way that we can ensure these skills is through a, a process of professional learning. And you know, Dan, I really like that quote, um, every student deserves an effective teacher. And as you said, that's why those of you that are participating in the webinar are here today, because you also believe that every student deserves an effective teacher. And I think that we revisit that as we go through the webinar. That's why we're here today. So let's take a little closer look at the difference between professional development and professional learning. Professional learning is often confused with that term professional development, because, but professional learning is ongoing. So any administrator or professional in a school setting working with children who are deaf and hard of hearing would develop their own plan as they work their way up a, traje a trajectory of learning. Oftentimes we'll interchange these terms and our recommendation is for us to move away from the term professional development. Take professional development out of your vocabulary completely. Most evidence-based practice is geared toward ongoing progress. So we ha what we have here are examples um, of professional development being a typical single shot, one size fits all workshop that might be based in one individual's expertise delivering that information. Some folks would say that professional development is three one half day workshops each year. I, I would beg to differ that that's not even professional development. That's just a one shot sit and get some information from somebody, which is sort of how the learning forward folks refer to it. What professional learning is, is a target, targeted and it's targeted and based on the specific learning needs of students in the school community. So it individualizes the strengths that, uh, and the needs that a teacher has, and it's grounded in adult learning theories. It's sustained and supported through the implementation of coaching and follow-up, and it's consistently monitored and assessed to evaluate the impact it has on student learning and is adjusted when necessary. We're using the term professional learning because we're reflective in our learning, and the professional sees themselves as a reflective a reflective part of that learning community. One of the things, Dan, that when I think about the difference between professional development and professional learning is that um, over the course, being in the field for 34 years, professional development was a way to get information to staff in schools, but it was more authoritative. So your supervisor said, here's the day of the workshop, everybody's going to this and you're going to like it and then you're going to come back and implement what you've learned. Where professional learn, the professional learning model is more reflective, where you're still working with your supervisor or your administrator, but you're coming up with your own plan. So you're much more reflective and it's purposeful. It, it has meaning to you as a professional, whether you're a beginner teacher or whether you're in the field as long as we're in the field. Right, so you're choosing what meets your needs versus someone telling you what your needs exactly. are. Right. A quote that I really like is this one here that says a teacher researcher is an observer, a questioner, and a learner as a result of, of as a result a more complete teacher. So professional learning, a professional learning model um, as a researcher is as a researcher someone who goes to a one day workshop um, Again, that tends to be more of a professional development where professional learning is an ongoing process. 
You might come away from a workshop with a few strategies, techniques, or ideas that you use in your teaching, whereas the professional learner is engaged in this process, process of ongoing change. So if we just take a moment um, to think about the last 15 minutes and realize that at this point we're professional learning, we're on a journey. And we do believe that every student deserves an effective teacher, an effective professional. We may interchange those words teacher, but there are many professionals in a school setting that uh, could benefit from this webinar and that who are working with the child. We have early intervention specialists. Uh, you could have your school nurse. You could have your um, speech and language pathologist. You could have your audiologist. You have general educators. Um, your special educators, and of course your teachers of the deaf. So there's a number of professionals within a school setting that would benefit from, from this model. So right now at this point, uh, we can assume that every professional in an educational community should be engaged in an ongoing learning continuum. If you're working with a child, if you have a child who is deaf or hard of hearing, you want to make sure that you get yourself on a tr uh, continuum of learning um, because we know we need it. We know why we need it now and we have to consider the role that it plays to be an effective teacher to support that child in meeting their needs and it actually is part of your own professional development and plan that your administration will be evaluating you. And we all know that we have performance appraisals that we participate in either tw uh, twice a year or once a year. And so this is the plan that you set in place with your administration to, in the end, look at your effectiveness as the professional in the school culture. Um, and as we had said, that the professional learning plan is more um, reflective than authoritative. So we're going to move into how, what does this actually mean and how is it organized? In the state of Pennsylvania, we follow, um, as, as part of our professional uh, appraisals, our professional learning, we follow the Danielson model. That's the model that we're going to use today. We're going to talk about this model, and it is used across the state in general education and special education. But your state, whatever state you're calling in from, has some um, framework to evaluate effectiveness in the classroom with their staff. So again, you can apply what you're learning today as we move toward listening and spoken language competencies. You can apply those to the framework of instruction that you're being, that, that's used as that evaluation protocol for you. But today I just want you to be aware, and there's a website reference at the link at the bottom of this slide, uh, we are going to be using the Danielson model. So there's four components of instruction in the Danielson model. So as a teacher in a classroom, as a speech and language pathologist, you're looking at planning and preparation. You're looking at your classroom environment, your instruction, and your professional responsibilities. And there's tools and competencies under each one of these components to be used as a foundation for your coaching, your professional development, and your teacher evaluation process. So you're taking your state framework, and now we're going to look at the listening and spoken language competency model that you will be incorporating into those areas, into that framework. So your components of a professional learning model in listening and spoken language is a set of tools that develop skills and practices of a systematic, purposeful inquiry and critical reflection on in nine domains of learning for listening and spoken language. This needs to be a part, a, actually a critical component of the educational con culture of a school. Um, the premise being is that years ago you may have had one child with the hearing, who, ha who was deaf or hard of hearing in your program, and if we reflect ba back on the 136 model um, and the mandatory newborn screenings, more children 
who are using hearing aids and cochlear implants are moving into the mainstream. And so this isn't just a need, this is a critic, should be a critical component of your culture. No matter what type of educational system that you're in, best practice is to have a learning model protocol for your team. Um, this um, quote, we really like this quote, but Dan would really like me to um, uh, share this with you. Because if you don't have a plan in place for your program, if everybody just does their own thing, and doing your own thing can be not doing anything, the effectiveness of your school program is weak. Um, and this quote comes from a, a book on supervision called Supervision, a Redefinition, uh, by Sergio Vanni and Starrett. And the quote says, and we think about it because it's, it's actually true. If we don't have guidance, if no one's um, really uh, moving the, the plan forward in the school, the metaphor of a minefield is appropriate because the activity, if not carefully mapped, structured and supported, can trigger toxic, legal, and political explosives that can affect morale and the running of a school. What does that mean, Dan? What do you think that, that means? That means be careful of due process hearings. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's really, when you look at it, um, if somebody, if everybody's doing their own thing and we're not meeting the needs of those children in the classroom, um, you can have a lot of issues arise. That's right. Um, not just within the school, but uh, between families uh, right. and between school systems right. and departments yeah, right. of education. You're right. right. So now you've identified the professionals. You may be thinking now, um, gee, I'm one of those professionals. I, I really am so glad that I joined this webinar today, and I'm going to join the other three as they uh, are scheduled. You may be an administrator sitting there thinking, wow, well, now I have a child coming in next year, and I think probably I'm not just going to focus on the teacher of the deaf making sure that they have competencies in listening and spoken language. I'm going to bring in the speech and language pathologist, the general educator, and I might even ask the school nurse to be part of this and um, uh, some of the other uh, teachers' uh, specializations. Um, so these are, we know what the Danielson framework is. So that's a, that's a state, that comes from the, at the state level that's that administrators are using for evaluation. So we're taking those four areas of planning and preparation, classroom environment, instruction, and professional uh, responsibilities, and we're going to merge them with the unique set of listening and spoken language skills that a professional community would requi require to the growing need of children coming into programs. These are the listening and spoken language core competencies. These are take taken from um, the Alexander Graham Bell Association website, Academy. And these are the competencies that a professional working with the child who is deaf or hard of hearing would want to have some level of expertise or skill set in. The requirements for the listening and spoken language specialist, as Dan had referred to earlier, and that is a certification. It includes a universal set of core competencies, which you see in front of you, and it includes professional standards for knowledge, skills, and practices, um, and, which includes experience, and it's necessary for the provision of listening and spoken language intervention for children. These nine domains can be part of any professional learning for any educator at any level. So even if there's a general educator in your program, whose plan is not to obtain lis listening and spoken language certification, it's still important for them to have a skill set and knowledge in those domains. Uh, we, we expect teachers should have a level of competency for every teacher. It doesn't matter where they are in their years of experience. Or, and so your question is, our question is, how do we incorporate them? And Dan and I have talked a lot about this, given this a lot of thought, is that um, we're never finished right. with our professional learning. And so you can be a first-year teacher or you can be a 30-year teacher, but you're always looking at being on this trajectory of learning in any one of those domains. That's right. So let's take a look at a tiered approach to learning. 
We're proposing that teachers play a key role in deciding which of the competencies are most significant um, given their needs at a given time. And if you are familiar with the conscious competence model, you know that as a professional, I need to know what I don't know. So in an effort to get everyone on board, we recognize that each professional comes to this model with different levels of experience and different levels of expertise. So now we're going to merge the two. We're going to take the listening and spoken language competencies and the components of instruction to create this tiered model. So you can see that this diagram is setting a framework of expectation for professionals at each level. There are a common set of elements that are unique to listening and spoken language, and these elements are important at every single level of this tier, or at each tier. In, the model, in this model, there are six tiers, and we recognize that it begins with the undergraduate professional. That person is likely to have um, fundamental knowledge and basic skills. And at the graduate level, at tier two, we expect that those professionals or those learning professionals are developing essential knowledge and skills similar to what um, they're required to have uh, from the Council of Exceptional Children and the um, uh, educators of the deaf, the uh, listening and spoken language domains, or even the state licensure requirements in order to be a certified teacher of the deaf within a particular state. Professionals at years one to three might be taking that knowledge and applying it um, and putting theory into practice, not just now and then as a graduate, like a graduate student might, but they're actually doing it every day, all day. Professionals in the three to five um, year range are refining and gaining more knowledge and experience and determining what their needs are. So as a teacher becomes more proficient, they should be able to identify their own needs using general educational frameworks with the listening, listening and spoken language essential knowledge and skill sets woven into those. So for example, if you're an undergraduate and you're learning about cochlear implants, you might know a lot about how a cochlear implant works. <clears throat> At the next level, a graduate student might be expected to truly understand the anatomy and physiology related to cochlear implantation and um, be able to understand how um, a cochlear implant works in terms of explaining it to another professional or a parent and the difference between the two, the access that's provided through a cochlear implant. And at a higher level, saw a professional who's been working for one to three years, you might have had a chance to apply this over time and begin to see the differences or the changes in a child's perception and production based on the amount of time they've had in a cochlear implant um, and some of that higher level knowledge. As you move up the tiers, um, your knowledge of cochlear implants, the differences in the devices, and the nuances of what children are able to do in order to access the curriculum with them will become more and more apparent and part of your learning trajectory. Right. To and use your term. I, yeah, that's my favorite word, trajectory. I like that. Um, and why do, we, why do we have this? Why is this important or this these tiers important is that we go back to that quote, every student deserves an effective teacher. And if we stop anywhere on any one of those tiers, um, that student's in trouble. Just remember you're on the blue tier. I'm on the blue tier. You're on the blue tier. I wonder where you go after the blue. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right, so now this just pulls it all together. We have our framework for teaching in any general ed program, any state, um, how this a state chooses to have their teacher growth and um, evaluation take place. And then we have next to that the listening and spoken language core competencies. So then the question is, how, do, how does each one of the core competencies, how does that get merged into any one of the four components of this framework? And um, what are we looking at is how can we build that framework? All the nine domains on the left-hand side of the screen can be addressed at any one of the levels in the framework. Um, it's the teacher who identifies, and this is so important, it is the teacher 
or the professional working with that child who identifies their own need at any level of the pyramid. From that need, that's where the administration supports their staff in the development of the professional learning plan that each individual staff member has designed. So, for instance, if you're in Tier 3, you might um, sit down with your administrator and identify what you need to know, and with the support of the administrator, how, how will you meet those needs and acquire the knowledge and skills um, at that level. And you could be in planning and preparation. You could be at, um, and you may be a, a six-year teacher, and yet your knowledge and skill set in a listening and spoken language core competency may be basic. It may be a baseline skill. So at another level with instruction, possibly um, your skill set in child development may be at the level of your experience. So that's why the plan is fine-tuned for you as the professional and only you know what your professional needs are. The teacher has, you as a, a professional or a teacher, have to evaluate your competencies regarding any one of um, those four frameworks for teaching. So when Dan and I were preparing for this, he challenged me and said, well, let's give me an example. And so it really made me take a step back and think about this, because we do this every day in our own programs. And um, so we took the first example that I thought might be helpful, well, actually Dan thought it might be helpful, <laughs> was to take a look at the domain one in listening and spoken language. And the domain one in listening and spoken language is hearing and hearing technology. So you're not, you, to be, uh, to be LISL certified, you would have an expertise in that domain. So you have a child coming into your program who has a cochlear implant, and um, you are on, um, you are a third year of experience teacher. And you want to look at the classroom environment. You appear to be having a technical difficulty. We'll be right back. We're back. <laughs> So we're looking at hearing and hearing technology. And as a teacher, you are a third year teacher. So you fall into tier one. Because any teacher in with experience of one to three years would be in any teacher with three years of experience would fall into tier that tier. And you want to look at classroom environment. And how do you set up a classroom environment that's conducive to the curriculum? especially for a child who has a hearing loss. So if you look at, we have 2A, 2B, 2C, you would be proficient at, um, at those. As a, a new teacher coming in, look at 2E, organizing physical space. So you come in in September, you're organizing your classroom, you have everything set up, and then someone says to you, um, well, you have a child coming in who has a hearing loss. So you're going to want to um, look at how you're organizing that physical space. If you're new to this, you are on that, um, that level. That's the beginning level. What are you going to look at? So you may go to your administrator and say, I'm going to, I'd like in part of my professional uh, development plan, professional learning plan. We don't say development That's anymore. That's right. We're trying to get rid of that vocabulary. That's right. Um, part of your professional learning plan might be to participate in more workshops, seminars um, on hearing and hearing technology because you may have no knowledge of what that means and the impact that background noise may have on access to the language and vocabulary of the curriculum. Um, so that would be an example there. Um, if we go to the next slide. Um, you may be in tier, you may be a fourth year teacher and you moves you into a different tier. So let's take the example of domain three in the framework, 
typical framework in any general ed setting is instruction. That's domain three. So you have communicating with students using questioning and discussion techniques, engaging students using assessment, demonstrating flexibility. And you're, you're, um, you have some proficiency in that area as a general educator. And then um, you learn you're going to have a child in your classroom who has a hearing loss. Your instruction, possibly using questions and discussion techniques, are going to change. What do you know about that? That's where you go to your administrator and say, you know, I, I'm, I'm not quite sure um, how that should differ by how I present um, in discussion groups with children who have typical hearing and what that might be for a child with hearing loss. Um, are you, if you look in the listening and spoken language domains, um, what are the expectations for student learning? Is there an adequate use of questioning and discussion strategies? Some of the strategies may be that um, you're doing more small group with discussion groups. You're, you have, you're using your um, FM system. You're making sure that if that child um, isn't amplified, doesn't have binaural amplification, which means they're amplified on both sides, or both ears are amplified, um, that you may need to sit with the better ear toward the, di the discussion that's taking place. Is the teacher asking a question identifying the student she's asking the question to and then repeating the answer. So those are listening and spoken language strategies that if, if a teacher is not aware of that, that could have an impact on the child in, in that classroom. And these strategies may seem very similar to just good teaching practice. Right. But when you have a child with a hearing loss in your classroom, they're even more important because you're checking for comprehension, what that student is really understanding on a continual basis. And, you know, sometimes when we're going in and doing in-services, many times um, after the in-service we'll have teachers say, oh, well, we, are, we do that with our children. Right. What we're doing is purposely identifying the strategies that would best support that child in a classroom who has a hearing loss. And yes, the strategies do work for other children, but we can never assume that that child with the hearing loss in the classroom is getting the information. We want to make sure that everything right. is is set in place. If we're effective teachers, we're ensuring that children with hearing loss are accessing the curriculum at all times. Exactly, right. So what I thought might be helpful to share with you is, and this is just one model, this is the Clark Pennsylvania's Professional Development Program for 2013-2014. So we really um, walk the talk or do we talk the walk? What do we do? We do both. Okay. <laughs> Um, and so we took into consideration um, the professionals who are on our team. So we have audiologists, teachers of the deaf, speech and language therapists, and we have regular educators. So with that in place, how can we develop a professional learning plan? And it says professional development. I know, but we're going to change that. We are going to change that. It's a professional learning plan <laughs> that, um, how can we design that program? for teachers, SLPs, audiologists, general educators who we have staff that have come in are in their first year, professional year, and there's some of us who are in their 34th year. Some of us have more than 34 years. I'm not going to say who that is though, but they know who they are. <laughs> <laughs> so how do I, as the administrator, how do we, I design a plan, a professional learning plan that will meet the needs of everyone level of experience in the field and also their areas of expertise. So instead of having a professional development plan where I do a couple of workshops a year and everybody attends, um, what this um, identifies are the areas and opportunities for professionals to devise, to design their own plan and then provide them with the opportunities that they can pick and choose. So if you notice, there's three columns. There's the part one, part two, and part three. And the professionals have met with me as the administrator and have come up with their plan, meaning that um, at the time of their performance appraisals, they have listed what they have attended, what they've participated in. In addition, it's important for me to know because they have purposely considered, they, staff will come to me and say, I'd really like to go to um, this conference at Children's Hospital on a specific topic. If it's not supporting their plan, I'll ask, is this supporting your professional development plan? 
Um, if it's not, I'd rather use the funding that we have available towards something that's going to support their de professional development plan, professional learning plan, because there are a lot of great and wonderful workshops out there. Um, we could go to all of them, um, but we want to make sure that we, we are um, fiscally responsible um, using the funding that we have available for professional learning. So in part one, we have two workshops. Um, and the one workshop, that first workshop, we actually opened that up to, uh, to uh, professionals across the country. And we did have several people come in from other states. So it wasn't just geared toward the staff at Clark, Pennsylvania. Um, if you look at March 10th, we brought another speaker in. And everybody did participate in that. The selection of these presenters, their agenda met the needs of any professional. It didn't matter what level of expertise you were at. And then also we um, recommend that our professionals get out to see other programs. So everybody has to do one school visit. Um, when we're looking at part two, each staff member is responsible for five professional learning activities of their choice. And they can, these are some of the suggestions, but it's not limited to those suggestions. Um, and they can read books. They can do online webinars. But what they do is, after they finish that, they complete a form um, that they submit to me so that at the time of their performance appraisal, we sit down, we go over it. And, um, you know, if I see that maybe someone has only, in, by January, if someone's only participated in one professional development, I need to discuss that. There may be challenges. Maybe someone is just having a hard time um, trying to find a substitute. or So I really take uh, serious consideration as to why aren't you moving forward um, at a f faster rate with your plan. And then part three is we do have five. We plan five in-house uh, professional learning presentations and staff can pick three. So again, you can select, our staff selects what's going to meet their need and is it two, is it at a more basic level. Um, we don't want to waste anybody's time, we just want people to be effective. So tell us about that process that you went through with your staff um, oh. and how you did a group professional learning or professional planning time with all of them together. Right, you mean with the little video I showed you That's this right. morning? So um, we have to have fun when we come to work. And we, we do want to take ourselves seriously because we want to be really effective um, professionals. But we also want to have a little fun afterwards. So one of our staff, um, and I, I don't take responsibility for this myself. I have other team members who have supported the development of this professional learning plan. Um, on March 10th, we had an in-service day, an all-day in-service day. And it, to incorporate some fun into that, after lunch, we had everybody write on a paper airplane uh, what their professional learning goals were for the year and what they've achieved or what they would like to continue to look at. Maybe they haven't reached those goals yet. So they wrote it on the little paper airplanes, and then we all went to the top of the hill, all 28 of us, I believe there's 28 of us, and we um, had someone videotape us, and we just threw the airplanes on the count of three to see who's went the furthest. And um, it was just a fun activity. Um, you know, when you're working with, with children or young adults, um, we have to put things in perspective and know why we're in the field and just to be effective and meet their needs and to let them know that we really care about their progress. So that was a fun activity. Just gave us a few minutes to have a good laugh, and mine fell to my feet. I'm not good at making paper airplanes. <laughs> it, is a, it was a nice activity, and it looked like they were having a lot of fun, mm -hmm. too. Okay, so that's one, uh, let me be very clear, professional learning program, the, the one that you use at Clark PA. There are other professional learning models that we need to, um, you know, acknowledge that mm -hmm. are out there. There are many. You can go on the Internet and find all kinds of professional learning models or designs out there. And one that I really um, find helpful is uh, all the professional learning information from the learningforward.org group. It's an association with support from the MetLife Foundation, and it's a great research, I'm sorry, a great resource for understanding the benefits and the breadth of professional learning. Um, they really believe that learning designs or learning models relate to the increase in educator effectiveness and student outcomes. And so they take it very seriously, and they include when they focus on 
these models, they include um, a real design that applies learning theories and the research that's already out there. They use a variety of models um, from face-to-face -to, -face to online learning to hybrid formats. They keep in the forefront of their minds that the adult is a learner, an adult learner, um, with the expectation that they are an active participant in their own learning, so they have active engagement. And that learning includes the acquisition of knowledge, the acquisition of skills, the transfer of those skills into practice, and this also is supported through reflection, assessment, and evaluation. But it's important to remind everyone that it's not just for the professionals, but the whole impact of change is really the impact that it has on student outcomes. And ultimately, that's it. That, that's, that's, that's what this is all about. Right. It's, it's supporting the teacher, but what's, what are the outcomes for the children? Right. And effective teachers. It goes back to that quote. An effective right. teacher has effective student outcomes. Right. Um, one of the models that I looked at uh, quickly, and I recognize that, oops, there's a cutoff there on that slide, but I'd like to just sort of describe it. In New Jersey, there's um, a model that can be used, and the first that we talked about were reflecting listening spoken language, but other models like this New Jersey Department of Ed model can be used by any program. Um, however, it can be an opportunity for you to apply it and incorporate the listening and spoken language competencies that Judy um, identified and gave us an example from. So in this particular model, their focus is professional learning goals, professional learning activities, then essential resources, and a progress summary. And it, again, it's just one more example of uh, m many models that are out there. And again, just to consider with these models, these various models, is that it's not a one-size-fits-all. And I think that's really uh, one of the, uh, what we're stressing in this webinar today is, is that we really need to purposely consider where every professional is at, in their uh, career. Mm -hmm. uh, because it's not a one-size-fits-all. And once you move toward a one-size-fits-all, you move away from professional learning and move right back into that professional, professional development, development model. model. It becomes less individualized because right. it's, it's almost a template that you're putting on everyone rather than a framework that you can use mm -hmm. for individual professional learning. Exactly. Some of the resources that we found really effective um, were in this slide you can see Judith Warren's Warren Little's Excellence in Professional Development and Professional Community is a great research source um, um, by the Department of Ed that is available. And um, topics to guide schools that are assessing professional development slash professional learning supervision and staff development or learning efforts, it's important to ensure that you're linking to student learning goals, so student outcomes, linking what the professional is gaining to student outcomes, the organization of teachers' work, the participation of professionals in activities. It's not just a sit and get, where it's always that you go to a workshop and you listen and you walk away with a few tidbits. Um, staff evaluation is important, assessing where a staff member is and where they want to be. Again, it doesn't have to be separate from that person's own desires, but they should be using their own reflection and your evaluation as an administrator or supervisor to help build their knowledge and skill base. And then a, a program, a school or a department that has a value for learning or a culture of learning is one that can really incorporate new uh, models of uh, learning uh, most effectively. And, and Judith Warren Little's um, presentation, she actually developed these topics to guide schools in assessing their own professional learning programs. And under each one of these um, categories or statements or topics, um, administrators are to ask questions um, as to, for instance, links to student learning is what elements of the school culture um, build the teacher's individual and collective responsibility. When, when I look at the value system, um, does the school value professional learning? That's an important one. If you're in a school that doesn't value professional learning, you're not going to get very far with the professional learning plan. And, and as a, a faculty member of a college that prepares teachers, one of the things that we're often saying to those new professionals going out into the workforce is, 
ask those questions in your interview. Does the school that you're applying to have professional learning opportunities? What are they like? Mm -hmm. What's the school culture around professional learning? Right. Some of the resources that we liked um, included uh, A.G. Bell's um, information from their academy and the Listening and Spoken Language Specialization uh, Certification Program, Dennis Sparks at WordPress, First Years, which is an online intervention training program uh, with coaching and mentoring components. Learning Forward, as I mentioned, other online learning opportunities that are great resources for all of us are Hope Online um, learning opportunities. Websites like the Eddy website and Karen Anderson's website, these are all general resources that we go to on a regular basis and we will actually provide you in, after this webinar with links um, and um, uh, the list of resources that we have here so that you can have them as well. One of the resources that is great is the one that's provided by the Academy at A.G. Bell's um, at A.G. Bell and it has a suggested reading list and we'll also share that link with you so that you can have that um, in terms of good materials to be looking at all the time and preparing for um, working with children uh, who use listening and spoken language. And that's a three, that would be it's a three, three slide. Page. You can see it's a three slide. Um, so that really ends our webinar for today, but we want to make you aware of the next webinar offered by the Clark Schools, and that is on Wednesday, June 4th at noon until 1. Um, it, the title or the topic is Authentic Engagement, Empowering Parents to Participate During the Preschool Years. The presenter is Meredith Berger, who is the director of Clark Schools New York Program, the, for, not, Clark Schools for Hearing and Speech New York Program. And the um, continuing education units are pending approval for that webinar. Um, but you can always check on the website, www.clarkschools.org slash webinars for more information or to register. I want to remind everyone that um, there's a follow-up and evaluation. An archive of this webinar will be in, uh, available in the next few weeks at the link provided. And tomorrow, all of you will receive a follow-up email that includes a link to an evaluation. If you wish to receive either a certificate of participation or um, CEUs for your listening and spoken language specialization certification, um, you must first complete this evaluation. So please direct any questions that you have in the webinar um, to webinars at clarkschools.org, and Judy and I would be happy to answer those. Um, as I said, we'll provide you with uh, the list of the resources that we used for the webinar. And do we want to take any questions at this time? Okay. So one of the questions is if the slides will be available. The resources, I believe, will be available, but the intent um, was to have the recorded webinar. So you all you have access to the recorded webinar, and you can revisit that, and the resources will be available to you. If there are no other questions at this time, we want to thank everyone. Oh, Judy's looking at questions, scanning questions. We're just. No, I think I think we've covered. I, that question came up several times with the if the slides would be available. Okay. Okay. So so thank you everyone for letting us talk with you about something that both Judy and I are very passionate about. We we may not be the complete and ultimate experts in professional learning, but it is a passion for the two of us and we were excited to be able to work together and put something out there that we would challenge you all to engage in. Thank you. Thank you. Have a great day.